Today, we're going to talk about obstacles to cure. Uh, now, many of you might think this is weird, but this is actually a specific term in homeopathy, uh, which I thought was fascinating for a number of reasons, because, because we think we can achieve a cure without going over or around or somehow dealing with the obstacles. And every form of medicine tacitly acknowledges that, but no one actually talks about it other than homeopaths. And so I, I wanted to ask you guys, what do you think the, the words obstacles to cure means? Can anyone take a guess? What do you think that means? I, I feel we're, we're our own worst enemy in our, in our mind. Yes. And when I hear people telling their story, I'm like, stop it. <laughs> um, so I think we're, we're our, sometimes we're our own worst obstacle. Yes, yes, yes. Anyone else got any thoughts on what obstacles to cure might mean? Yeah, I have two aspects of that. One is internal, one is external. Mm -hmm. Internal are the mind or all the constructs that we create with our mind or are affected by other sources. The external are things that we're in amidst of, like air, water, sun, uh, touching other people, things that are outside our physical body. And either or both of those can be blocks to, if they're regularities or things that don't work, they can block us from healing. Absolutely, absolutely, such exactly right. Anyone else got any thoughts on this? Renee, surely someone has more ideas on what an obstacle to cure might be. Cultural attitudes that interfere with your being to ideas. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, yes, yes. We have this ism in our head. This is how one must be. This is what you need to do. And when we look at the objective evidence in front of our eyes, which is this is how you are. This is what's happening to you. We, we somehow put, put on blinders to it. We're not able to deal with the evidence of our own eyes because we are moored in these cultural or deep-rooted thoughts that this just could not be. So true. Anybody else? What's an obstacle to a cure? What, what were your obstacles to cure? Anytime I have a thought. Um, this is Angelica. I have a thought. I, I lately in my own life, it's been um, the sort of altar of convenience in the culture I grew up in, and that we've made a lot of sacrifices to personal health and our the safety of our environment because we want certain conveniences. And I, I'm just thinking of a simple one like owning plastic Tupperware. That sounds really sensible. It's light and it's affordable and available and and then, you know, then you, then you have plastic always reaching into your food. So I just, um, that's one way I think that our environment is an obstacle. Yes, that is, that is mm -hmm. so on point. We are taking shortcuts because we, the shortcuts gets us places, some places faster. And that's actually a long-term obstacle. So true. So true. Um, anyone else got anything to say about obstacles to cure? I have another one which I just realized. There are obstacles that I wasn't aware of were obstacles before I was educated or became aware of them. Things like 5G or things like electromagnetic fields or about the, the qualities of certain kinds of foods or things I use on my body or all those kind of things. So those are obstacles that I wasn't aware of before I became aware of them. Absolutely. Absolutely. And all of us fall into that category. Oh, gosh, the things we've done. You know, I thought the microwave was the best invention since sliced bread until I read all the lawsuits that were flying around on microwaves. Yeah. Um, so, yes, yes, we do things out of convenience. We reduce the time it takes to do any activity. We reduce the strain on our bodies and our joints. And pretty soon we're going to a gym to do those exact same small movements that we could have easily incorporated into our lives by making it just a little bit more uncomfortable. Um, anybody has anything else to add? I have one, one more. Yes, Con please. 
it's uh, continuing on my other story about things I wasn't aware of, the aware that I learned certain things and only limit the awareness of those when I'm doing or when I'm involved in that particular pattern that I don't learn, I have learned since to extend that beyond that original impetus or that original movement. I mean, that's particular to my study of traditional Chinese medicine that, or physical practice of that. I was, oh yeah, I did my form, I did my work today. Didn't realize until some years ago that I can extend that in the rest of my life. So that's another one of those. Little... Yes, limiting limiting what we consider to be obstacles and not realizing the bigger icebergs in our lives. Yes. 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 Uh, and Sushma, I think relying on the medical profession for, for everything rather than uh, searching out uh, and, and asking more questions and putting them um, to the task rather than believing. Um, I, I had relatives that just think that if the doctor says it, it has to be right. And that very often I found through experience, especially is, is absolutely wrong. You, you know, trusting, trusting oh. in the medical profession and pharmaceuticals yes. has been the downfall of, of millions of people. Yes, yes. Sadly. That is probably the single most important obstacle to cure, yes. Well said, Paula, well said. Very well. Yeah. Margaret, Margaret, Paul, yeah. why is your called Paul, Paula? Margaret, sorry, Paul yeah, Margaret. Margaret. Yeah, I am Margaret. <laughs> <laughs> Thank yes. you. Well said. Anyone else want to say anything about obstacles to cure? All right, all right. So we go to the next one. Um, so I'm first going to talk about Hanumanian definitions of obstacles to cure that he wrote in the Organon, oh, close to 300 years ago. There was this guy in this world who made observations uh, about humanity, about mankind, about the then medical professions that were so astute and so astounded, astounding that all I can do is repeat them word for word. And so what he said was, there are some factors in this respect, this refers very specifically to illness that you have. Um, uh, there are some factors that hinder cure by obstructing the effects of properly prescribed homeopathic medicines in spite of suitable dose and proper repetition. So what he's saying is, you look at that person, you look at, take down their case history and say sulfur is the exact right remedy for them and you apply it and it doesn't work. What the hell? What, what the hell happened? Why ever not? At that point, a allopathic physician would just continue to apply more of that medication in order to maybe suppress the symptom or maybe to amputate the leg or pull out the tumor or cut off that part if it did not uh, go according to his will. Um, the, but, the, but Hanuman says the physician has to know what the obstacles to cure in each particular case are. And as we've made our journey over the last several years, all of us, you and me, have figured out all the obstacles to our cure. And I think of it as snow melting, a big mountain of snow on this beautiful gold nugget. As the snow melts, as it melts, your life force kind of rises and it has the ability, it has the innate ability, it has the intrinsic ability to heal itself. And it's a beautiful thing to watch as every obstacle, it's sort of like peeling a banana or peeling an apple. Things fall off and you just feel better and better and get better. And you cannot ascribe it to any one thing. You cannot say, oh, I started um, you know, using master tonic and this happened, I started doing this. It's not any one thing. It's multifactorial, but as you peel away the things that you know make you unhealthy, your body figures out ways to heal some very entrenched, some very, very chronic diseases. And he goes on to divide it into three parts. One is an exciting or maintaining cause. So the, the obstacles could be of many types. 
one and we'll, we're going to give examples of each kind of obstacles so that you can think about it in your own lives and see what those obstacles are and rather than focusing on my fibromyalgia or my parkinson's or my cancer or my multiple sclerosis or my celiac or my gastritis the key here folks is to think tangentially think about the things that you could do that would help to heal and let the body handle the healing and that in the real world is called an exciting or maintaining cause. An exciting or maintaining cause is like the slums of Dharavi, and I'll, I'll get to that. But these are things that you can clearly see. And if you remove these obstacles in the physical world, there's no more disease. The second obstacles to cure are things that are pathological, which is now you're sick with the typhoid or sick with COVID and you can't seem to get better. And as a result of that, you might have heart damage or you, as a result of diabetes, you might have gangrene and you got a, got a leg cut off. That's a structural change that's pretty irreversible. If you just had your finger chopped off your nail, it would grow back, but some of the organs that are taken out, for instance, cannot grow back. So this is, these are pathological causes, or if you have cancer and you get your lymph nodes taken out, what happens? Your electrical meridian gets messed up. Your lymphatic system gets messed up and your body is not clearing the toxins from the area where the lymph nodes got taken out. So now you have made a kind of a reversible, irreversible change to your system. There are some people who can grow back the lymph and then there's some people whose arm just keeps swelling and swelling and swelling and they, yeah. they have lymphadenopathy and it gets worse rather than better. So yeah. that's uh, did someone want to say something? I've seen that happen. Yes, yes. Yeah, yes. with the lymph, with, especially with the removal of the lymph nodes, yeah. Yes. And we think we're doing them a good turn. We're taking the cancer out. But mm -hmm. imagine the ivy growing in your garden. These are young, tender shoots. They're growing like crazy. And you say, oh, ivy, I don't want you in my garden. And you cut it off. What happens? What happens to the ivy that's cut off? It dies. Uh, that ivy is cut off, but the, the vine grows ever bigger. The vine grows ever bigger. You've not rooted out the problem. Mm -hmm. And that is what you do when you take out, amputate, when you remove a cancerous part or a limb or, or whatever. It, the body is creating that condition. The body is creating that cancer and it can just throw out 10 more where you, you took one off. Mm -hmm. so that's a pathological or structural change. And then the final kind of obstacle is a miasmatic one. And I'll walk you through the experiments of Pottinger's cats, which is, which is a good way to see why we or our elders, you know, they were eating out of cans and they were living life very frugally in their 50s and 60s, but they had no problems. And they're saying, what, this child has problems that I'm getting in my 50s and 60s um, or that my, my, my child, my son, got the same problems that I got in my 90s and their 50s and now my grandchild, grandchild is getting them when they're two years old. That is a miasmatic cause. That is something you pass down intergenerationally and we've passed it down unbeknownst to ourselves um, as a result of the use of the foods of modern commerce as a result of steroids, antibiotics, painkillers, anti-inflammatories, vaccinations, surgeries, just, just reckless use of mercury in the old days, chemo and radiation in the new days, same thing. What we're doing is passing on sperm and egg that are of very poor quality to the next generation. And that's a miasmatic um, obstacle to cure that Hahnemann spoke about. And so uh, ENM is uh, exciting or maintaining cause. So here's Paul Farmer, a doctor, an amazing doctor who lived and worked in Haiti and they had people had tuberculosis, people had diseases you could not cure with multiple antibiotics. And after doing this stubbornly and doggedly for like 20, 30 years, he realized, gee, if they had 
a clean water supply and a clean sewer supply. 90, wherever he did that or got it done, in 90% of the cases, all disease disappeared. So the exciting and maintaining cause of disease there was sanitation. It was not multiple antibiotics. It was not multiple surgeries. It was not multiple interventions. They, they were hungry. They were starving. They were pooping in their drinking water. And once you fixed that, the human body knows how to deal with its own health. The Can I just say one thing? Yep. Well, you were saying nutrition. They didn't have good nutrition. And that's like a lot of what's going on in America. We don't have soil that has minerals and our water is not uh, nutritious water and our lifestyle, you know, to actually metabolize our food. It's not, we're not, it's not nutritive. Yes. You know, even if we have the best quality food, if we, if we can't assimilate it. Yeah, it's, it's yeah. So true. Exactly. Exactly. In some sense, we are living in a third world country here because our food is so processed, it's so modified, it's so laden with Roundup and GMOs and this and that. And um, medicine is third world. We have third world yeah. medicine. And we have third world medicine, yes. And so all the medicine that we're putting into ourselves, all the foods, bad foods, uh, are, are obstacles to our cure. And one of the things that it brings to the fore is the human body was designed to deal with disease. The human body knows how to deal with infectious disease. If you make sanitation, if you create good food, you literally have to do no homeopathy, not even homeopathy, definitely no allopathic, any interventions. Um, the body will heal itself from terrible, terrible diseases. And so exciting and maintaining causes are the leaky boat. So you're, you've got mercury, you got amalgams when you were young. And after about 10 years, they start to break down and you're drip, 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 dripping mercury into your body. You can eat all the glutathione you want. You can eat amazing foods while you have poisons coursing through your body. You're not going to heal yourself. And that is a basic obstacle to cure that everyone can remove. Everyone can go and eat better quality food or people who can afford it. Uh, everybody who can afford it can get the toxins out of their body. And that obstacle to cure will then be released. It'll melt away, it'll go away and your body will figure out next steps. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about animals here because animals go through many generations in our one lifespan, so a dog you know, four dogs or 10 dogs can live in the lifespan of a human. And so uh, right in Sebastopol uh, was started this amazing animal rescue place called Bright Haven by a British woman called Gail Pope. And she loved animals. And so she started this rescue. Um, and initially she was doing everything with her animals by the book. These were animals that were lame, blind, old, had cancer, were about to be euthanized um, and she took them all. She took them all, she placed them in her home um, and she discovered that the modern veterinary practices were killing animals faster than just about anything else. So she, she the first three or four years she was giving them dutifully all the, the vaccines, the, the regular shots, the, the antifungals for ear infections, the latest um, uh, pet food, manufactured pet food, and they were dying. They had a lifespan of eight to 12 years at most. Dogs that should have lived for 10 and 20 years or more were dying in eight to 10 years. And as soon as she got them, she would make all these efforts to do all these things for them and people would donate money and all that and the animal would die. And she slowly figured out that the trick was number one, diet. So she changed the diet from kibble and the science diet and canned foods to freshly prepared raw meats, uh, species appropriate foods. So dogs are omnivores, cats are carnivores. So, so just raw meat for the cats and different organs, different types of meats and change it up. Uh, with the dogs, she gave them a little bit of vegetables, but largely meats, raw meats. And guess what happened? 
I will give you an example of Frazier, who is a legend in their rescue operation, lived from 1972 to 2006. He was a 26 year old cat brought with cancer who was brought to them as a hospice cat to die. He died at 36. She changed his diet. He had a will to live. Uh, they have homeopaths who work with these animals. So they, do, they use no veterinarians other than to do the diagnosis, the blood test, the urine test, and if, if surgery, if surgery, if it's needed, if it's impairing a vital function. So a, a homeopath was assigned to this, this cat and the cat proceeded to live for 10 more years. That's probably the longest living cat in the history of at least known mankind. Um, and he lived well. He had a giant cancer in his eye when he came and they said, oh, he'll live for one or two months. And then uh, that's why he, he was sent there to die. Slowly, 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 as the animal gained its vital force, as it gained nourishment, as its problems got fixed with uh, classical homeopathy, the, there were big scabby things around his eye that fell off and they realized, holy smokes, he can actually see with that eye. So that's the picture of Frazier. Imagine him with a big cancer in one eye and he died after 36 years but for good life. Same thing with Ollie, their uh, 40, 14 year old dachshund who had, who came to them with ear infections, severe fevers, he would have raging fevers um, to die and he lived to 24. Just by taking away the exciting and maintaining causes or the obstacles to cure, these animals literally lived forever. So when we talk about, you know, making ghee or eating raw butter or raw cream or beet kvass or master tonic or green slathered in, in fats, we're talking about food, which is completely incidental, it seems, according to medicine to health. But this is the sort of stuff that keeps you from landing in hospitals, from getting flus and colds and pneumonias and ear infections and cancers, um, it will heal. It will heal. Holistic medicine will heal. And so this is the obstacle to cure that the Bright Haven Animal Rescue used for all its animals and they lived their days out in peace and in very good health. And their, their philosophy is something worth thinking about for our own lives. What they said was, what Gail Pope, this is a lay person, an unread woman who just had a love for animals. She's not a doctor, she was not a nurse, she was not a healthcare provider. She just loved animals. And she started taking in animals that were scheduled for killing basically, or who were dying. And her philosophy, their philosophy, fundamental tenets were, there's a difference between curing and healing. You can heal a wound by sewing it up, by suturing it up. You can purportedly heal a cancer by lopping it off, but you cannot cure it. Uh, curing is typically thought of as achieving the absence of symptoms. So current medical dogma says, if you don't have pain, that means you're cured. If your headache is gone, that means you're cured. Um, conventional medicine uses medication or surgery or, or whatever interventions to attain this outcome. But what they're saying is what Gail Poe believed and ascribed uh, to the longevity of her pets was the suppression of symptoms does not mean the underlying causes of disease have been addressed. Just because your headache went away or your diarrhea got stopped or your constipation got stopped with uh, Mu Murelex or fiber or whatever, it does not mean that the underlying condition has disappeared. And that's what you need to heal. So holistic medicine looks at healing as an internal process focused on becoming whole. And, and let's break that apart. It's an internal process. It's not you doing it from the outside. It's not a doctor. It's not me doing it. It's not a third party doing it to you. 
It's your body which needs to, must, and does heal itself. Your body is your doctor. And the way to get your body to be your doctor is to peel off. It's like peeling off socks, peeling off the layers of obstacles and letting it do its thing. And you can rest assured that it will. It will do its thing. Restoring the balance and harmony to the body, mind, and spirit. Uh, hugs are absolutely critical. The reason I keep harping about hugs is, guys, if you don't have relatives or friends, go knock on your next door neighbor's door and give them a hug. Hug a dog, you know, touch. Get the life force from another vital being. Um, you need to restore, you need to have energy in order to have balance in your body. And you need to ignite that. In the last two, three years, it has been deadened. We need to undeaden it. It is not uh, distancing and masking that's gonna keep away the illness. We've had COVID happen at the same time in Belize as it happened in Wuhan. At the same time in Africa, someplace remote, it is, it is not because an infection travels. There are other things that become disarranged with our body. And the way to address that is to address the balance in, uh, in your body, the spirit igniting your life force. And what she finds, Gail Pope finds, is this approach yields many benefits, including the resolution of symptoms. You don't have to be an oncologist to cure a cancer. You don't have to be an, 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 a doctor to cure a wound. The wound cure will happen if you take away the obstacles. A cure occurs when the body is able to fully heal itself. Healing for the highest good of the patient. And, and there's this concept. Um, and, and I saw that when uh, my mother-in-law, Miriam was passing, um, she wanted to join her husband in heaven. She was not interested in living. And so for her, the healing was to go meet with this other spirit who was her kindred spirit. And death may very well be the right mode or right thing for that person. You know, some animals just stop eating. They know they, they want to die and that's that. For others, there's a huge will to live. There are people who want to see the sunshine, gaze at the ocean, hug their children and grandchildren and friends and who have this purposeful life and who have to go and do censuses and count all these things and learn to make a bunch of different dishes or go hiking around the country. Uh, they have a purpose and, and that's what lends you the vital force. So I would say whatever your passion is and there's no person amongst you who does not have a passion. Follow it, follow it. You'll improve your health and have a love of life. Um, and then there'll be a time. When is time? Time's up and your time is up. But you don't have to die. Pets don't have to die from euthanasia. Pets don't have to have horrific treatments done to them. They can literally die in their sleep, gently, peacefully, in the sun when the time comes. Any questions? All right. No questions. Um, and so I am gonna make this go down here so you can actually see this. Um, everybody see it okay? Yes, everyone see it okay. Um, obstacles to cure, uh, whoopsie. Uh, it, he has written aphorisms, Hanuman has written aphorisms and what he says is, therefore the physician, a good physician is not going to tell you, hey, lady, you're depressed, here, take this antidepressant. He's gonna hear, he's gonna hear that her son just passed or her spouse just passed away or she's been incarcerated uh, in a house for the last three years because of this, that or the other and, and deal or treat the underlying causation. So hence the careful investigation into such obstacles to cure is so much the more necessary in the case of patients affected by chronic diseases, as their diseases are usually aggravated by such noxious influences and other disease causing errors in the diet and regimen, which often 
pass unnoticed. You will notice that when you have allergies, you go to the doctor and say, doctor, doctor, why did I get allergies? And the doctor goes, I don't know, there's no reason. Here, take, take the steroid or take this antihistamine. You go, doctor, doctor, I've got this boil. Ever since I had that accident, I've got had this pain in my thigh or this, ever since I had that injury, I get this suppurating wound. The doctor doesn't understand or doesn't pay heed to the aggravating cause. But in homeopathy, in life, if you focus on the root cause, I guarantee you the obstacles, addressing those obstacles will cure your current condition. And we have evidence of that with Frazier, the cat, with Ollie, the dog, who had cancer, who had acute chronic disease. Number 262, in acute diseases on the other hand, except in cases of mental alienation, that's mental disease, the subtle unerring internal sense of the awakened life preserving faculty determines so clearly, so precisely that the physician only requires to counsel the friends and attendants to put no obstacles in the way of this voice of nature by refusing anything that the patient urgently desires in the way of food or by trying to persuade him to partake of anything injurious. So when you're in a hospital, the first thing that you see is there's tube lights blaring down. What does a patient need the most? Can anyone guess what a sick, sick person need the most? Take a guess. Someone unmute yourself and take a guess. What human, is human attention? Oh, what? Human touch and attention. Yes, yes. Quiet. Quiet. And, peace. and yeah. peacefulness, yeah. Peacefulness. And water. Water, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. They need to rest. They need human touch and attention. When I had mm -hmm. the dengue, the fact that our CTO was holding and rubbing my hand, I still remember in my delirium this guy doing it. And I swear it pulled me through a very deathly illness. Uh, mm -hmm. They need quiet. They need to sleep and not have nurses and doctors bustling mm -hmm. around and waking them up for 20 medications every 10 seconds, you know? Yeah. <laughs> because that is healing. Sleep is way more healing than steroids, antibiotics, painkillers, fever reducers, hormones, amalgams, <laughs> vaccines, anything. And so, so if you remove these obstacles, which is why I say COVID, maximum COVID um, mortality will be reduced by people living at home simply because you're not surrounded by this noise, you can actually rest. Even if you did nothing else but rest, you'd do better than to mm -hmm. be in a very stressful, trauma-laden mm -hmm. environment, which you don't need for something like this. Unless I you see. Yes? I just wanted to say, um, in the big medical pharma <laughs> complex, we are there to make the hospital's money through the insurance. So we are the the domestic animals we are the cattle and um you know so it's all between the doctors and the hospital and the men in the insurance companies so we are we are disposable yeah, yeah yeah that's a very good point because um used to be you paid for your own health care when you did the doctor could not look you in the eye and charge you 200 bucks they would look at you and see your ability to pay and pay you and charge you less now, a third party is paying. You don't know what they're paying. Everyone is out in bill city, billing city. Everything is run for a profit motive, not as a public service. And, and as a consequence, almost unbeknownst to us, things have become very perverted. And, and that happens over and over again. A child that goes to a doctor with a cough or a cold or influenza, if the doctor says, no prescription required mother, just make him chicken soup and rest, the doctor doesn't get paid. They do not get paid 80 bucks a pop to, to prescribe chicken soup. And so we're causing uh, through, our, through our great desire to streamline operations, we're causing uh, these obstacles to cure in society, which are almost pathological. You can't get past them. And so you guys, because you're so special, are not ever gonna fall for these things. You're never gonna fall for these things. And you will have very good lives. And so those are the exciting or maintaining causes. Um, 
And then there's the pathological causes, which are the structural changes that happen through surgeries um, and the reversible, irreversible damage they cause. And then there is the miasmatic cause. And we're going to talk about Pottinger's cats. Uh, could you raise your hands if you've heard of Pottinger's cats? Yes, many people have heard about Pottinger's cats. Pottinger's cats are amazing cats that were an experimental, I don't know if it'd be permitted in this day and age, but Francis Pottinger Jr., who was a father like his doctor, uh, started this experiment with lab cats because he was trying to come up with an adrenal gland for his fibromyalgia patients. So he took adrenal glands of cats out, out, and then fed some cats, uh, fed these cats raw milk, cod liver oil, and cooked meat, meat scraps. And because his cat population was growing, uh, he had to get another set of cats to do <coughs> <laughs> to do the same experiments on, excuse me, and he ran out of meat. <coughs> and what did he do? He went to a local meat packing plant and he got organ meats and bones and fed the cats. <coughs> and what he found was that the cats, excuse me, that were fed raw meats within months became healthier than the cooked meat group. Their kittens were more energetic. The kittens were healthier. And mainly the raw fed group's post-surgical mortality, because he had to <coughs> cut these uh, adrenal glands open and take them. The raw fed cats, uh, surgical mortality, post-surgical mortality was much lower. So he said, holy cow, that's the effect of nutrition. What did I do wrong or what did I do different? One set of cats got cooked meat. One set of cats got raw meat as nature had intended. And the raw meat cats had better kittens, better coats, less disease, survived more after surgery. Then he said, I'm gonna start a 10 year experiment to look the intergenerational effects of feeding cats different things. So he took 900 cats, three generations, divided them into two groups. One group he fed cooked meat plus um, uh, raw milk and cod liver oil. The other group he fed raw meats plus uh, raw milk and cod liver oil. So the only difference was cooked raw. Cats who ate the all raw diet were healthy, while cats who were fed the cooked meat diet developed various health problems. And not only did they develop problems in this life, they developed problems in their progeny, their children, their children's children, and their children's children's children got worse and worse. And how did they get worse? He tabulated it. He documented it. By the end of the first generation of cats that got the cooked meats, they started to develop degenerative diseases. You get this? 200 years ago, we were eating pretty unprocessed foods. About 150 years ago, we started that. Those people are between 100 and 150 years old. So the people who are 80 years old now are the tail end of the commercial food, uh, be the beginning of the commercial food generation. And we have seen in seniors today a spate of degenerative illness, or seniors of the last 50 years. Dr. Pottinger saw that they became la lack of energy. They, had, they couldn't do stuff. They could not uh, move around. They could not play joyfully. They, they had to be prodded. If you have to prod, if you, if you can't, used to be farmers could throw bales of hay that were 90 pounds. Today's farmers can only do 30 pounds. Today's children farm, who are growing up to be farmers. They displayed decreased energy levels. They had children. What happened to the second generation of children? They all suffered from degenerative diseases by midlife. By the middle of their life, uh, they, the cat life, so for cats, 40, 50 years of age, 
they started to develop degenerative diseases. They also showed a decrease in their coordination. They were stumbling around. And by the third generation, the cats developing degenerative diseases while they were very, very young. They had frequently offspring that were born blind and weak. This generation did not live as long as the previous generations and many were sterile. Many could not conceive, even if you know they didn't have the mojo, they did not have the hormones. Uh, there were more problems with parasites, fleas and vermin. And I saw that firsthand with our dogs. When we inherited them, they got, oh my God, the fleas and the ticks and the parasites they got. Soon as they got on raw, milk, uh, raw meat, all their problems went away. While skin conditions and allergic reactions jumped from 5% in the first generation to over 90%. Uh, so this is a miasmatic obstacle to cure, which means it's coming down from grandparents, parents, children to their children. And that takes longer to fix. That is what Hanuman saw required a miasmatic prescription, meaning a child might have allergies and he might give sulfur for the allergies because it fit the child and the allergies are not going away, not going away. Then Hanuman would look at their parents and parents, parents and parents, and maybe they had tuberculosis, a tubercular miasm or a cancer miasm. And when he gave them remedies for those miasms, they got healed. So isn't it amazing that Pottinger's cats in the third generation were pretty much dying off, but Hanuman discovered that for miasms, you have to treat them differently. Uh, kittens of the third generation did not survive six months. Their bones were soft, tended to break and bend more easily, pliable. They suffered adverse personality changes. They had much more aggression. They were much more moody. They bit more. The males became more docile while the females became more aggressive so the testosterone estrogen balance got warped. And by the fourth generation, there were no more cats. And guys, we are, I think, in the third or fourth generation. But there's hope. There's hope in miasmatic cures. And I have seen children, they're the born to mothers who had amalgams in their mouth. So right out the gate, they got mercury mercury uh, uh, concentrates and fatty tissue. So the child came out of the gate, semi-autistic. They got 30 shots in one year of their life. They were in ICU because they stopped breathing. So they got steroids, they got antibiotics, all sorts of very, very toxic things. By the time they're two, they lose their speech, they lose their, their eye contact, they lose the ability to, uh, to engage socially, or they have severe physical ailments such as asthma, eczema, so on and so forth. And I have seen people tell me tales of miraculous cures to these intergenerational influences layered on with current generational um, exciting and um, stimulating causes get well. These are children that have healed if caught early on with seed therapy or miasmatic prescriptions. And so there's hope yet. And so when I think of obstacles to cure to very chronic deadly disease, this is how I think about it. I think of it as a bunch of snow on all your pebbles, those beautiful pebbles. And as the snow melts, as the snow melts, your body heals itself. Your body heals itself and you know not why. So you could say, so in, in my case, uh, I got asthma from the forest fires in Malaysia. I came here and, and I thought I was dying because every, I was allergic to everything. And then I started drinking raw milk and I started changing uh, some of my other lifestyle habits. And I don't know what caused it to happen, but one day I was no longer asthmatic. One day I could breathe. And that's the remarkable thing about respecting the vital force of your body and respecting the fact that you really 
us humans are like that. Us humans are tiny, tiny, tiny creatures, and we have very little ability to cure ourselves from external means. We have to let our body heal itself. And so with that, I am going to stop.